Good morning, everybody. I trust all of you are well and good today. Yes. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus, thank you for gathering all your dear children from far and near to come and meet with you today, Lord. Thank you for your wonderful grace that was available for us and in us this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to inhabit on the praises of your dear people, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving, and the offerings that were given to you in your holy name. Now I ask you, Lord, stretch out your blessing hands and lay it upon each and every one of your dear sons and daughters this morning. And I ask you, Spirit of the Living God, open our hearts, open our ears, give us an understanding heart and a listening ear that we may hear what the Spirit of God will speak to the church today. In the name of the blessed Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated everybody. <coughs> so this morning I will conclude this series of subjects that I have been teaching you from Friday. The series is called The Coming Glory of God. So, a few months ago, you all went through a 40-day fast to prepare for what is going to come to pass. So now, the word of the Lord is, what is going to come? That which we have been preparing for. Not only this season, but for a long period of time. So this morning, I will conclude this series with a message entitled, Prepare for the Coming Glory. How to prepare? We heard what it is, the do's and the don'ts, and the specific word of the Lord for this church. Now, we conclude. So how do we prepare? Nothing happens by chance. Although, every move of God and every outpouring of God is a sovereign grace of God. Yes. Amen. Like, yes. uh, like I've been telling you for the past two days, why did God choose me? <laughs> why did God choose you? Grace. Simply grace. Amen. Simply grace. However, you need to prepare yourselves. It's grace. But the preparation is necessary. For example, Samson was predestinated by God that such a baby should be born to such a parents and he will grow up to be a judge in Israel and he will set his people free from the bondage of the Philistine. However, he needs to prepare. Sub specific instruction was given to the parents how they should prepare themselves during the pregnancy period and then how Samson should govern himself in all purity because he has a special anointing upon him. He's a Nazarite, that's his special calling and special anointing. So as a Nazarite, there are some do's and don'ts how they should live by. The thing is this, it's not the rules. When you come into the house of God, the first thing you want to do is shut the stupid phone. Can you please check your phones now? If by chance you have forgotten to 
put it to death. <laughs> Once during our conference in Israel, see in my own conference, I am a stickler for rules and we emphasize very strongly about switching off cell phones during the services. So after giving so strict announcements about switching off cell phones at every service. So one evening, I was interpreting for the guest speaker. And suddenly, at the tick of the anointing of the message, a cell phone went off. So I, I told the speaker, please just excuse me for a minute and I gen kind of rebuked the congregation and then the speaker gen gently tapped on me he said it's okay I said no it's not okay again he said no it's okay I said no it's not okay you know why he was saying me it's not okay it was his phone He had it right in his pocket. I was, I was doubly upset because a speaker should have more better sense. Why do you need to bring a cell phone when you are going to preach or you are coming into the house of God? Anyway, see that is also part of preparation. So anyway, let's come back to Samson. It's not the rules of do's and don'ts. It is the holiness of the anointing. How to guard it? That's the thing. You need to guard the sanctity of the anointing. It is holy. Anything about God is holy. Without holiness, no one can see God. Why there were so many rules in the Old Testament was that God was teaching us what, how we should approach the Holy God. If not, the holiness will kill us. He's so holy that it will kill us. Why did God have to ask Adam and Eve to leave the Garden of Eden? Because the holiness will kill them. Now they are already defiled. They have sinned and sin and deadness cannot dwell with the living. The dead cannot live among the living. Amen. If that rule applies in the earth, how much more in heaven? Right. When it is the land of the living and darkness cannot abide with light. So if you are full of darkness, how can you abide in the city of light? Not possible. That is why, like how we sh will teach little ones, don't do this, don't do that. The children of Israel were like little kids who didn't know anything. They were living for 400 years in a land filled with idols filled with immorality, filled with filthiness. They had no law. They had a knowledge of the invisible God of Abraham. But they do not know who he is, what he is, his character. So now they are separated. You know, they have been indoctrinated for 400 years of a lifestyle, of the Egyptian lifestyle. 400 years. That is about 10 generations. Approximately 10 generations. Their very DNA are all now Egyptian. So God has to take the Egyptianness out of them first. That is why the sojourn in the wilderness, going through all the difficulties. They are now used to seeing God in the form of idols. They have never tasted and see how good God is or how 
powerful he is now they must be introduced to how great this jehovah god is so god purposely led them through the wilderness to teach them how great a god jehovah is he cannot be made with human hands there was a shortcut for them to bypass directly the sinai peninsula and they they, they had need not have gone through the red sea but god led them through the red sea for two purpose one to exact vengeance on the egyptians secondly to show the israelites how great a god he is that all things are possible nothing is impossible unless and until you have an experience no matter how much academic studies you do about the the title nothing is impossible with god you will never understand what it really means that all things are possible with god you will never understand that you need to come to a place of hopelessness desperation and then when god does something supernatural for you then you will practically understand what it really means he is the supernatural god i first came to understand this in practical ways in the year 1986 so the lord had me go through the northern part of india in a place called ladakh ladakh is like tibet the entire land is sits on a plateau surrounded with mountains and the plateau is at about 12000 feet above sea level and villages dot all the valley small villages some villages there are just a few houses some maybe 100 houses 20 houses 50 houses small small villages to walk to go to those region there's no other mode of transport except to walk and i walked for 12 days over 420 kilometers up the mountain down the valley up the mountain the highest peak or mountain that i climbed to cross was at 17000 feet wow. above sea level and totally covered with snows wow. and during the early days of my ministry i never wore any sandals and i walked barefoot on the snows and by all natural means i should have got frostbite on my feet and they should have been amputated by all natural means but for 12 days the lord sustained even when i walked for 8 km at a stretch on the snow that was the longest at a stretch and to sleep one entire night on the snow mountain because there was no other lodging my only uh, spread on the ground was a thin sheet of plastic no sleeping bag no blanket nothing and it was the grace of god that sustained me you know and the tibetan people they have peculiar i mean not peculiar told, for them it's normal and because of the cold climate all the bread are hard like a rock and how to bite them or eat them i need to soak them in a hot water for 10 minutes wow. before it becomes little soft to bite so that was one one diet secondly their tea the tea that they drink you know you drink tea you drink coffee with milk and sugar don't you yes. they drink it with not sugar but with salt and instead of milk they use yak butter it is so no sitting <laughs> is yaki is yaki 10 feet away when they bring the cup to you 
you want to throw up. <laughs> and I had to drink that for 10 days. No other choice. In order to keep yourself warm, you have to drink it. So each time I hold the cup, I pray a prayer binding my nose, <laughs> binding my tongue, that I'll be senseless, totally senseless, so that I can just simply drink it without tasting it. After 10 days of eating that food, one day, I had a strange desire. So I, I clearly remember this one morning at 6 o'clock before we started our journey. I, I spent a night in a Tibetan monastery. So I knelt down and I prayed. I said, Lord, you know, I've been eating and drinking this Tibetan food for 10 days. Today, I would like to have a nice piece of chapati. Chapati is the Indian bread, a big bread, which is absolutely tasty. <laughs> have you eaten naan before? Yes. Okay. Chapati is the older sister of naan. <laughs> and it is unleavened bread, so it is most healthy. So I prayed. So I need chapati, Lord, and some pickles hot pickles and a nice cup of Indian tea <laughs> so I made this prayer and then I said but I know it is impossible for you to provide this in this wilderness which is naturally true because in the Tibetan area such food is never available so it is absolutely impossible for God to provide Chapati, pickles, and Indian tea. Even if it rains down from, God rains from manna, right? But pickles don't rain down from heaven. Right? Yes. They don't. Either does Indian tea. So I, I say, Lord, I know you cannot do it. It's okay. Please don't feel bad. <laughs> I literally say that please don't feel bad that you cannot provide <laughs> please don't feel bad it's all right you know you're my father I'm your son I just made my heart's request known to you but please don't feel bad at all I, I perfectly understand <laughs> so having said that we started our journey so there was another sadhu with me. So we walked for three, mile, uh, three hours and we came at an intersection. The road was splitting to the left and to the right and right in the center of the intersection was a small, like a house. So we didn't know whether to turn to the left or to the right. So I told my fellow worker, let's go to the house and ask for some directions which way we should go. And as I entered into that little house, it had a small kitchen and a small bedroom. And there were two men lying on the bed, one on the right side and one on the left. And when I looked at them, I knew by their looks on their face, they were from the northern part of India. And they were still sleeping and uh, I said, sorry to disturb you. Please, we just like to know the direction, whether we should go to the left or to the right as I was speaking. The servant from the kitchen came out and he carried his plate like this, you know. And he, instead, you, you see, when you come out of the kitchen, you should go straight to the intended person, right? But this cook came near to my nose <laughs> and showed the plate before my eyes like this. <laughs> And guess what was on the plate? <laughs> Chapati wow. and pickles. <laughs> when I saw that, I said, Lord, there goes my food. <laughs> <laughs> and he brought it to his masters. I found out that those two guys were scientists who were camping in that area for the last three months to do research on snow leopards. Snow leopards are very common in that region. Yes. 
so they were part of the conservation society to study on snow leopards and how to conserve them so you know in in the indian custom when a guest comes to your house even if the guest is a total stranger you first serve them then the host that's the culture if you visit my home okay and if i have my family they say my sisters and my like my sister and my nephew and his wife are there they will not eat first they will first serve you then they will eat last that's the culture they don't even sit together to eat so so when the cook brought the food to his master in all true indian fashion he said no please serve our guests first so the cook came to us and and brought the food i couldn't believe my eyes chapati and hot pickles not spicy hot but warm hot because in the cold you don't want to eat cold things you want it warm so as i was holding the plate in my hand i said lord chapati is here pickles is here where is the tea you wouldn't believe what happened next the the cook brought a hot cup of indian tea with cow's milk and with sugar when i held it in my in my hands tears just rolled on my eyes and that day i understood what one, one thing with god all things are possible Amen. Amen. If God can produce chapati, pickles and a nice cup of Indian tea in a Tibetan desert, what more can he not do? What more? That day this truth sank deep inside me. There's nothing impossible with god wow. nothing see you need such life changing experience yes. then it becomes real inside you. Yes. you that is why you must pray yes. that you have an encounter with god yes. you must pray don't let it go no. it's either you see or you die I'm sure you have heard of the late great man of God called A. A. Allen. Yes. He had such a hunger in his heart. He told his wife one day, "I'm sick and tired of my Christ Christian life and my just usual ministry. I'm going to meet with God. I will not come out until I have met with God. I'm going to fast and pray. Don't I not? I don't need any food." So he locked himself in his room. and never came out for several days until he saw god amen amen the lord a ball of light appeared before him and the lord spoke to him and then when he came out of his room his wife could literally see his face glowing with light amen. and his entire life and ministry changed after that amen. and this was also the experience of william branham He went to the woods and he told the wife the same thing. I'm not coming home until I meet with God. If I don't come home, then you'll find my dead body by in the woods. And there the Lord appeared to him. And my nephew's wife, Ruby, stand up. She comes from a very godly family. Her grandfather who was like a spiritual father to me he had such an encounter with god he got married and his wife died 55 days after the marriage and he was a very highly educated man with double masters degree and his family are from the aristocratic of the society in southern part of india so when he lost his wife it shattered his entire life and he went up to a mountain to seek the face of god and he told his family if i see god i will come down if i don't see him i will die up on the mountain and he prayed 
and he prayed, said, Lord, if I don't see you, I'll rather die here. And after many days of praying, the Lord Jesus came down from heaven and spoke with him and gave him a commission to do the ministry. You must have that kind of a hunger. Don't be satisfied with your good for nothing Christian life. Amen. The life that you live, you might as well better be dead. What good is your life? You are living a dog's life. Have you seen a dog? Does he go to work? No. He just lazily gets up whenever he likes to get up. And then lie, the, lie down in the sun the whole day, waiting for the meal times to come. And then after eating the meal, it goes to sleep again. Isn't that kind of a dog's life that you are living? And you are so proud of such a good for nothing dog's life. When God has a greater glory for you, he has a greater glory for you just on the other side. If only you are willing to pay the price and cross over. Yes. If only. The children of Israel would have eaten the good of the land if they had entered into the promised land. Yes. Right? That was their destiny. But because of unbelief, their stupidity, their arrogance, their pride, and their stubborn, good-for-nothing Christianity or theology, they died in that wilderness having the promise. Yes. That's the sad part, you know. Yes. Doesn't the scripture say that? They died having the promise. They have the promise. They have that assurance. But they died. Disqualified because of unbelief. You have a promise from God. You must take the step of faith to enter. To obtain the promise. If not, forever you will go around and around the wilderness in your life. You will go around and around and you will die there without even seeing a glimpse of the greater destiny that God has for your life. You have to decide. That is why God has brought you here. To hear this, what God is going to do. Not only for this church, but in the worldwide body of Christ. The glory of God is coming. For the remnant. Those who are willing to pay the price. Those who are willing to lay down all. Read the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Why, why all those characters mentioned there? You know, chapter 11 is called by theologians as the hall of faith of fame. Why is it called like that? Why are they called heroes in the hall of fame? Because each one mentioned there, men and women, were willing to die to inherit their destiny. They are willing to die. Die to their dreams. Die to their ambitions. Die to their stinking flesh. So that they can enter into the fullness of the real destiny. Not what you think is the real. So how do you prepare? How do you prepare? On the 9th of August, 
another phone. See, I told you, I gave an opportunity for everyone to check whether you have switched off your phone or not. On 9th of August, 2023, at 7.39 in the evening, I set to prepare the messages for this conference when I heard the Lord Jesus say these words. The glory of God will come as he has determined, but it is necessary for the people to prepare to participate in and with the glory. Yes. Whether you are prepared or you are unprepared, the glory of God will come. Yes. Because God has set a time yes. that in this particular time, in this particular year, this will happen. Either you are in it or you are out it. That's the only difference. It will come. But it is necessary for the people to prepare to participate in it and with the glory. The children of Israel not only saw the awesome glory of the Almighty God, but they also experienced the glory. They saw as a spectator and they experienced it as a participator. How? They felt it physically and heard the audible voice of God speaking to them in their own language. Some rabbis say, and I've read some of their commentaries, that God actually spoke in 70 different languages. Because the children of Israel, during the 400 years of living in Egypt, have learned 70 different languages that are spoken in that region. Because there's trade going in and out. Traders come from other parts of the Middle East and other parts of Africa. They come to Egypt and they go out. As a result of this interaction, they have learned 70 major languages that are popular in that region at that time. And God's voice, when he spoke, see, God speaks in his own language. Yes. But when you hear, you will hear it in a language that you know best. Yes. So if you know English, you will hear it in English. If you know it Spanish, you will know it, you will hear it in Spanish. If you know Samoan, you will hear it in Samoan. You know Tamil, you will hear it in Tamil. In your own language, in your ears, you will hear it. They felt it physically and heard the audible voice of God speaking to them in their language. And they experienced waves of the glory fire come from the top of Mount Sinai upon them. It went through them and went over them. That is why some Bible scholars call that event that happened on Mount Sinai as a baptism of the Holy Spirit like experience for the children of Israel. And that experience shook them so much that it literally frightened them to the core of their bones. So much so, they feared dying and didn't want to stay further in God's presence. So therefore they asked the prophet Moses, you go near to God. Yeah. You speak to him. We cannot bear this anymore. You speak to him, you hear him, and you come and tell us. And we will hear from you. You read this in Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 to 19. Such a glory as the Israelites experience is going to come in your days. Hallelujah. Such a glory. It's going to be an earth-shattering experience. The whole world is going to see 
the great glory of God Jehovah. Hallelujah. Whole world. For one final showdown. One final showdown. It is going to come in your days in a greater measure than what the Israelites experienced that day. So now the question is, how much more than this generation should prepare for it? How much more? Now I want you to have this sink inside you. You know what's the difference between the Israelites and you? The Israelites only, let's suppose this pulpit is Mount Sinai. And all of you are the Israelites down at the bottom of the mountain. Just like you can see the top of the pulpit and the glory fire above it. Just imagine it. So all the Israelites were there and they saw the glory from afar. And it shook the daylights out of them. <clears throat> but for you, the glory is not going to be here. It's going to come inside you. Hallelujah. Yes. It's going to come inside you. How much more? How much more? If anyone touches the mountain will die because of the glory, how much more a sanctified life you should live for that awesome fiery glory to come inside you? How much more it will kill you if you are not sanctified? How much more? So to, so to spare you, the glory will not come upon you. It will pass you by. It will pass you by. And you will end up like the Israelites who told the prophet Moses, you go near. We don't want that. So you will look at another group of people and say, okay, you go. Go, you go. I did not qualify. So why should you end up like that? Is that God's will? No. 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 It wasn't the will of God for him to only speak to the prophet Moses. It was the will of God to speak to the entire nation at the same time. But because of their unpreparedness, they lost that privilege of hearing God directly, seeing God directly, being in His presence all the time. They lost that privilege. They did not lose, you know. They themselves rejected it. They rejected it. Right? Yes. They rejected it. So will there be two groups. The prophet Moses here represents ministry leaders, heads of ministries, who are called to lead God's people in these last days. So they must prepare themselves. The first group, the leadership. Those who are in the fivefold ministries, those who are special calling. The second group, the common Israelites, they represent God's remnant people who are called not only to experience the glory personally, but also to exhibit the glory to an unbelieving world. You are going to be God's ambassadors. Amen. Now this is something I've been emphasizing yeah. these past two days. Right. Each one of you, I dare to say this statement, each one of you are going to be a mini Jesus. Yes. 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 Can you believe that? Yes. Can you believe that? Yes. Can you believe that? Yes. Each one of you right. are going to be a mini Lord Jesus who will demonstrate the awesome powers of the age to come. Amen! 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 You are going to be the workers. You are going to be the doers. Not just the spectators. So determine today. 
that you will no longer be a spectator. You must determine. You must have that determination. You must decide in your heart. No more. No more. No more. Today, I will make a difference. Yes. Yes. I'm going to seek God like never before in my life. It's either I make it or I die. For that, I will. I am willing to forgo anything. Like the Apostle Paul said that to win Christ, I count all things done, done, all things. And for your information, the Apostle Paul was a highly educated theologian in his time. In, in today's standards, he may have a few doctorate degrees. He would have been qualified to be one of a highly educated scholar, theologian in some top seminaries. That was how brilliant he was in the natural. And then he says, I count all things done. All done. For the excellency of the knowledge of God. If you, read, if you read, just read the book of Ephesians, how much of divine mysteries were revealed to him. No other book in, the, in his epistles contains that much of divine mysteries like the book of Ephesians. Many mysteries were revealed to him. Even the apostle Peter said, Oh, our brother Paul... Some of the revelations he gives are too hard to understand. And such a man says, all things done. All things done. I count all my knowledge zero for the excellency of the knowledge of God. You must come to that place. Come to that place. Nothing wrong getting degrees. But all those are just paper. Just paper. Three years ago, a, a, a theological seminary in India wanted to confer me an honorary degree of a, a doctorate degree. No? So usually I have rejected all such degrees in the past. So this bishop, archbishop, has become a dear friend and he, they really press on me, said, you know, for all the works that you have done, we just wanted to honor you. So I made it a, a point of prayer. So I asked the Lord, shall I go and get this? Get this. So the Lord looked at me and he asked me a question. What will you do with that? So I pondered, you know, all right, with that degree, I'm not going to get a job in any other church or neither am I, can I get a job in any other Bible college or seminary? So I thought, uh, so I said, Lord, you know, I will just frame it and put on a wall. <laughs> so he looked at me and he said, to hang a piece of paper on a wall, do you want to go all the way to get a degree? Say it's paper. Paper. Right? Just paper. Any computer can print it out. Paper. Right? Paper. What is real is inside you. The excellency of the knowledge of God. Amen. That matters more. Nothing wrong, you know, you can get one degree after another degree after another degree doesn't matter you can have all the 26 letters after your name doesn't matter what matters more is the excellency that you pursue after the Lord Jesus that should be your passion that should be your hunger and intimacy intimacy with the living Christ that's what matters. Once you have an intimate 
living relationship with the Lord Jesus, you will always know the mind of Christ Jesus. You will always know. You need not pray each time to ask, Lord, what is your will? You will always know because you have the mind of Christ inside you. You will always know what is the good, the perfect and the acceptable will of God for your life is. You will always know it. You come, must come to that place. So what is the glory of God? Chiefly, it is His goodness. If you read Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 and 19, and He said, Please show me your glory. Then He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So when the prophet Moses asked to see the glory of God, the Lord told him, my glory is my character. My glory is my nature. You want to see my glory? First, get to know my nature. First, you get to know me. First, have that nature inside you. Yes. Then you will walk in that glory. Yes. Shortcut. See, God was showing him a shortcut. Because the glory is holy. You cannot directly receive the glory. That is why he told him, you, no man can see my face and live because he is the holy God. But I show you a shortcut. A shortcut is get my nature. My nature. I am a good God. Full of tender mercies. Full of compassion. Develop this in you. Once you develop this in you, you will walk in my glory. You will walk in my glory. I am sure you have heard of the testimony of uh, Sister um, Heidi Baker. Right? She had an encounter with God. And the Lord fill her with love. Now she doesn't pray powerfully like some of the healing evangelists, right? She just hugs people. Hugs. And her heart touches the heart of the suffering person. And the love of God inside her flows out to the suffering person. And they receive their miracles. See? The goodness of God carries the glory. There it is. It's the goodness of God. So you want the glory? Imitate the character of God. Imitate that character. How is the character of the Lord Jesus? He's a good God. So you become a good person. How is the character of God? He's a merciful God. So you become a merciful person. Always forgive everyone. Don't keep any grudges in your heart against anybody. How good is God? He's a God of compassion. So you become a compassionate person. Walk in compassion. Show compassion to everyone. The good, the bad and the ugly. Don't just show compassion to the good people. Then it is not real compassion. You should show compassion even to the ugly person. Ugly person. I once read the testimony which Pastor Sweet shared with me about the experience of this man of God who was here a month ago, oh, yeah. Fenn. John Fenn. Yeah. He once wanted to know how great or good God is. So an angel of God came and took his, him in the spirit to a place. He didn't know which place it was. And they stood at a very busy street. And there they saw a man pushing his cart full of vegetables. Very poor man. He and his wife and maybe his children survive on his one meager income. So he must sell all the vegetables that day so that they can have a simple meal. So that particular day he could not sell any vegetables the whole day. And before he left his house that morning his wife told him, darling we have no food to eat 
So you must, after you have sell all the vegetables, when you come back home, buy some groceries so that we can have food on the table. So he said, all right. From morning till uh, late in the afternoon, not a single person came to buy any vegetables from him. He was so broken hearted. He wondered how can he go home empty handed. So he was almost to tears. So this angel who stood beside Brother Fen told him, look what we will do next. So the angel went and moved the hearts and the minds of all the people in the streets to go and buy groceries from this man. So suddenly, people felt motivated or some thoughts come into their mind to go and buy vegetables from the man. All his vegetables were sold. And he was a very, very happy man. See, God takes care of his children, right? Yes. Right? Yes. Am I right, everybody? Yes. Does God take care of his children? Yes. So this proves, right? Yes. Right? Yes. Say yes loudly. Yes. Okay, good. God takes care of his children, right? Yes. And don't, don't forget your answer. All right, don't forget your answer. Does God take care of his children? Yes. Now, don't forget your answer. <laughs> so, brother Fan stood there. He was so happy. He lifted up his hands. He said, thank God. And he has seen with his own eyes how God takes care of his children. So, then this man brought all the necessary groceries, more than enough for his home. So, he came home and he gave the bags of groceries to his wife. And now the angel and brother Fen followed this man into their home because they were going to see oh, how much their family is going to give all the glory to the Almighty God, right? Yes. God takes care of his children, right? Yes. So after he had given the bags of groceries to his wife, this man went to his prayer room. He knelt down, he lifted up his hand, he said, Allahu Akbar. Now who says that? Brother Fen was shocked. You mean this man, this man is not a Christian. He's a Muslim. Again he repeated those words to Allah. Brother Fen was shocked. And he turned to the angel and he asked, I thought this, he was a Christian. How is it that you all went to help him? You know what the angel answered him? God always tells us he died for everyone. He died for everyone. Am I right? All. Whether you believe him or you don't believe him. Whether you know him or you don't know him. The Lord Jesus Christ died for the sinners. Sinners. So when we help, we should help irrespective of who they are. That's right. What is their religious background? Amen. 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 Yes. We used to receive many requests in our ministry in India every month from different religious groups of people. When, uh, when the school year opens in the month of July or June, I received lots of requests from students, some parents asking for scholarship. And we give to all that we can, whether it's a Hindu, a Muslim, or a Christian. We give to everyone, irrespective of what their religious background is, and no questions asked. And recently there was a typhoon in India, and one entire village was wiped out. All their roofs were blown away. So I sent my team to do a survey to see what, how we can help them. Now this entire village is non-Christian. Not a single Christian there. I mean, we took down a list of how we can help them and we gathered all the funds that we have in our ministry and we bought them all the groceries that they needed to live through. And you know what the villagers asked us? Why are you doing this to us? Do you want us to convert to your religion? We said, no, you don't need to. 
we just came here to show you that the Lord Jesus Christ cares for you. Oh. Period. And we walked away. No preaching was done to them. But you know what happened after that? They came looking for us and wanted us to start a church there. <laughs> Showing compassion. When they see love in action, they'll know who is the true living God. So that is the character of God. His goodness, His compassions. In the same manner, our nature must be transformed to reflect the character of God so that we can manifest the glory of God. Amen. When you begin to be filled with the character of God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10 tells us, others, the Gentiles, will come to admire God in you. Amen. They'll begin to see God in you. You don't need to preach. I'm sure you've heard of Mother Teresa, don't you? Yes. Now she had a strict policy in her monastery that all her nuns should not preach Christ to any of the patients who come to their convent for healing or for care strict policy rather they should show Christ in action yeah. this, this was Mother Teresa's policy and all the Hindus living in Calcutta in that area where Mother Teresa lived all her life hundreds and thousands of them accepted Jesus Christ looking at their nature Hallelujah. hundreds and thousands of them by looking at the Christ in demonstration, not just preaching. Enough of preaching. Amen. There's so much of preaching from the pulpit with no life testimony. Right. Am I right? That's right. Yes. Exactly. What's the use of your preaching eloquently if you live a double standard life? Yes. What good is that? Let your preach be alive. Yes. So this is what we need to demonstrate in these last days. The glory of God. Yes. That is by that nature. The goodness of God. When you manifest that goodness, then they will see God in you. So what is the glory? Now turn your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. You should never forget this scripture in your life. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. And I encourage every one of you to memorize this scripture. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you. Come on, complete it. Christ in you seven words Christ in you the hope of glory the God of glory now what does this really mean Christ in you the God of glory will come inside you to manifest his glory not standing beside you he will come inside you. Now this is an experience I'm sure most of you have not entered into yet. You have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Am I right everyone? Yes. And the Lord Christ came inside you by faith. But it is totally a different experience for Christ to come inside you as a living Christ now turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 14 verse 23 
Never ever come to church without your Bible. Very bad thing to do. Amen everybody? Amen. And bring good old traditional Bible. Yes. No more digital Bible. Yes. John chapter 14 verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. Now look at the next sentence. We will come to him and make our home with him. Yes. We will come to him and make our home a boat. Yes. Tabernacle. It's the same word. Tabernacle. Inside him. So you will become the tabernacle of God. Hallelujah. This John 14, 23 is an absolutely different experience yes, it is. from accepting Christ Jesus as your savior. Yes, totally different. When the living Christ comes inside you, to live in you, where you'll be full with him all in all. When I first read this scripture, 35 years ago, I began to pray for this experience. Every day, every night, I will pray this. Lord, come and make your boat inside me. Come and make your boat inside me. Every day I pray. So after several years, once, during a ministry trip to Tibet in 1994, as usual, I was praying this prayer after meditating the scriptures. So one morning, as I was meditating the word of God in a small tent in the western part of Tibet, suddenly I saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing before me. And he said, you have been praying this scripture for a long time. Today, I have come to answer your prayer. Amen. After saying that, you know, I literally saw the Lord standing before me. He walked towards me and entered inside me. Yes. Just entered in. Like a real person entering inside you. He entered in. When he entered in, I felt him from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. It's like two person now in one. Full, full of the Lord. Jesus. And when I turn my heart, I turn my head, I feel the Lord's head is turning. When I stretch out my hands, to touch people, I feel and I see the hand of the Lord stretch out. And when I look at people, I see through the eyes of the Lord Jesus. And people look different. Different. Now, I don't, I don't find any faults in them. Usually we do, right? Oh, this person not good. Oh, that person not good. We have our own opinions. Don't we? Good, bad, ugly opinions. Today we like someone, tomorrow we don't like that person. Right? But, when you look through the eyes of the Lord Jesus, they all look good all the time. All the time. Amazing. Amazing. This is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Now why am I sharing this with you? To show you the reality of greater riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. By this you should know one thing. What a good for nothing Christian life you have been living so far. Yes. Am I right? Yes. Am I right? Yes. When you can have all this. But look at the life you are living. One, because of ignorance. You didn't know. But today you know. Yes. From today your life should change. Yes. Amen. Amen. From today, Amen. you are going to become a seeker. Yes. You will pursue yes. and not let go yes. until you get it. Yes. And next year when you come back here, I will be sitting there and you will be standing here. Amen. 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 Or even if you don't get to get, stand here, every one of you will be walking in the glory of God. Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. This is the will of God.
concerning you. This is the will of God. Not only Lancaster and this Shekinah becomes an oasis of love, but each one of you will become an oasis of love. Wherever you are, you become the tabernacle of the glory of God. And the Gentiles will come to you. They'll come to you. And the nations will come to you to know the riches of the glory of God in you. Now to experience Christ in you, the hope of glory, we must sanctify ourselves. And we can learn some vital keys and secrets of preparation from the lives of the Israelites. Please turn your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 19 verses 10 and 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Not some of the people. All the people. Right? Yes. All the people. So, look at the scripture again. Go to the people and consecrate them or sanctify them. That's the first thing. Second thing, today, tomorrow and the third day. So, three days of sanctification. So, what does sanctify or consecrate means? To be set aside. Fasting and praying regularly. You set aside regular days to fast and pray. To sanctify means to purge the flesh of bad immoral habits. Immorality does not only mean sexual immorality. Immorality also means anything that is not moral. That means in the right standing with God. That's also called immorality. So purge the flesh of bad immoral habits. Refine the flesh by the fires of the Holy Spirit. Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. Sit in the presence of the Holy Spirit and ask Him, Holy Spirit, purge me. Purge me. Send your fires through me. Let them burn inside. Make that your prayer. Whatever known immorality that you find inside you, take it out and place it before the altar of God and ask the Holy Spirit to purge it. You cannot do it on your own. You can crucify the flesh by the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. Secondly, look at the words today, tomorrow and the third day. To them it was a physical three days. But how does it apply to us in the spirit? Today, tomorrow, third day. Spirit, soul, body. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, tomorrow, third day. Spirit, soul, body. Must be sanctified. Because your spirit can be defiled. Your soul can be defiled. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. It says, cleanse yourselves of all the filthiness of the spirit. So there can uh, come a filthiness of the spirit. Secondly, in Galatians chapter 5, we read about the works of the flesh. That's filthiness 
of the flesh and the soul Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 work out your own salvation with fear and trembling that is the soul part because they all can get defiled so sanctify them sanctify them now please turn with me now to Exodus chapter 19 verses 12 to 13 now don't close chapter 19 because that's what we are going to linger on to glean principles from them Exodus 19 verses 12 and 13 you shall set bounds for the people all around saying take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death not a hand shall touch him but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow whether man or beast he shall not live when the trumpet sounds long they shall come near the mountains now there are two things that we read here one set bounds unto the people secondly not to go up the mountain or touch the border of the mountain so they were physically given those rules how do they apply to us set bounds unto the people means that we should abide by kingdom living principles and what are those principles they are found in Matthew chapter 5 6 and 7 what was the Ten Commandments and all the rules and commandments given at Mount Sinai are the same found in Matthew chapter 5 6 and 7 kingdom living principles so you want to abide by those principles secondly not to go up the mountain nor touch the border it means no unclean thing can come near God nor touch the things of God anything that's unclean anything that's defiled it cannot come near God I've always pondered over one thing in 2nd Samuel chapter 6 verses 1 to 7 you read of an incident in this incident the ark of the covenant that was in Philistine for a long time was now to go back to Jerusalem so King David had the ark of the covenant put on a cart pulled by some cows to be brought into Jerusalem and a man and along the way you know those they don't have good metal roads so they have bumpy roads so as the cart went on the bumpy rope it began to jostle or rather the cow slipped a foot and for fear of the ark of the covenant being toppled down a man called Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark the ark hasn't fallen yet but he just feared that it may fall and he held it and instantly fire came from the presence of God and strike him dead yes. do you know this passage yes. so all for a long time I'm wondering you know the man did a good thing yeah. right? right he did a good thing so why was God so cruel Serious. to kill him he did a good thing right? right what if the ark had fallen down then what is it okay for the ark to fall down? No. Shouldn't. No, right? Then why kill the poor guy for doing something good? I never found an answer. And I read so many commentaries, no one gave an answer. They can come up with this or this or this or that, but never a real answer. But yesterday, while I was preaching a different message, right? in a split second I got the answer Un unrelated to what I was preaching but it was inside me this question was in my mind for a long time this is how I get answers to my questions from the Lord the answer the Lord gave me was Uzzah was an unclean person yeah. unclean person he was not sanctified 
nor consecrated for that work. He was not a priest. So anything that is not clean cannot touch the mountain. So you, you must cleanse your life. Amen. Every day, you know in all your life, every day, whether you knowingly or unknowingly are defiled. Right? Yes. You are defiled. Subconsciously you are defiled. Some images that you see, some words you hear, you get defilement everywhere. Amen. And sometimes they are stuck at the back of your subconscious mind. And when you are waiting on God, they get replayed. Yes. And you think God is showing you all these wonderful images. <laughs> right? No. See, it, it, it will play. Or a dream comes to you. Based on all those things. And you, are, you may think, or you get confused. How come God is showing you all these things? So, we must cleanse our mind. Cleanse our imaginations every day before you go to bed just kneel down for a moment put your hand on your head and ask God to sanctify your imaginations sanctify your eyes for all the things that you have seen I do this every day the eyes the ears the mouth knowingly or unknowingly you may have spoken some things some words that may have hurt this person or that person or corrupted words come out of your mouth unnecessary words not necessary so ask the Holy Spirit to cleanse your lips and then imagination Amen. cleanse your imagination that when you go to sleep you are a sanctified person and the Holy Spirit can speak to you now Amen. show you visions or dreams prophetic kinds now, if you read Exodus 19, verses 14 to 15, we find three key principles how to prepare to meet with the God of glory or to receive His glory. Exodus chapter 19, verses 14 and 15. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes and he said to the people be ready for the third day do not come near your wives so three principles number one sanctify number two wash your clothes number three don't come near your husbands or your wives three key principles now what are they to sanctify means making oneself acceptable to be close to God as one belonging to God. So what do you need to sanctify? 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 You know, day in day out either we carry offense or we offend another person. Did you all heard an audible voice from heaven? <laughs> Acts chapter 24 verse 16 Offenses Cleanse your heart of all offense Never hold anything against anybody If you want to live a disease free life Get rid of offenses The key to a healthy life disease free life thirdly murmuring gossiping backbiting 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10 it brings great displeasure to God great displeasure so check your lips have you been gossiping murmuring backbiting Cleanse your lips. Sanctify them. Every day. That is why the Lord Jesus said, Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Anything more than that is unnecessary. Second principle. Second key. 
wash your clothes now this may sound strange to us today because we wash our clothes every day if not every day every other day but for that for the israelites it was not an everyday experience like for example the tibetans those who are those who don't live in the cities out in the wilderness they only wash their clothes once a year why because scarcity of water no water how are they going to wash their clothes every day they don't even wash their pots and pans every day in the year 1995 I had gone to a place in nepal called mustang so from the nearest airport called jomsum to go to mustang we have to walk for 5 days again up the mountain down the valley up the mountain so after walking for 2 days we had to spend a night in a small village and that village only consisted of one house just one house and that house acts as an travelers inn so the main house and they have an attached like a guest house where there are several beds so you rent a bed and uh, so in 1995 10 rupees big money today 10 rupees is nothing so we rented one bed together with my two associates we rented two beds and then 10 rupees for a plate of food rice and some lentil soup and with one vegetable so before we came into that house there were three other travelers and so the house owner a, a lady and her daughter they cooked food for that people it's always my habit to just look around you know every what are the what is in the house sometimes i get some illustrations from looking around so i notice how many plates there were on that um, on the on the closet and this woman was so i counted the plates there were three plates okay and i look at the guess how many there were three and as three so there were six but there were only three plates how I, how is she going to cook food for all the six of us i wondered you know if it, if this was south india no problem they'll just cut a banana leaf and they'll serve you so after cooking food this woman took the three plates put a mountain full of rice and poured lentil soup and took a scoop of vegetables and she put on the side and some pickles and gave to the first three person i said all right so we were seated there we were looking around doing some little chatting so now these three guys finish eating so now i wonder where so i looked around there was no tap of water anywhere and there was no river anywhere either because we had been walking the whole day and we never saw any river anywhere so i wonder how is this woman going to wash the plate because there are no other plates how is she going to wash them and serve us <coughs> so this three men she sometimes see uh, the indians like the nepalis they we eat with our hands yes. healthy you know it's very healthy <laughs> i can prove to you you know when you use a fork and a spoon or a fork and a knife do you know where they went who was the other person who used that where there is a scientific person or non scientific <laughs> you don't know right you just assume by faith yes. that is clean and sense uh, sens- sanitize but your hand is always with you all the time <laughs> and you know that your hands are clean all the time so you can trust your hand see that's why i mean eating by hand is very very healthy so this guys so some so before i go any further so sometimes when the food is so delicious what they do is they scoop everything and they lick their hands <laughs> I do that sometimes. <laughs> My daughter-in-law she is an excellent cook. So when she when she cooks, I'll make sure all the wiped clean. <laughs> okay, so these guys, these three guys, they did that. 
they even scooped every little bit on the plate and they licked their hands okay that's okay then they gave the plate to the woman now I was wondering what is she going to do she took the plate she stuck out a tongue and she She licked every little bit of whatever left over on the plate until the plate was sparkling clean. <laughs> and my worst fears now came to pass. <laughs> she scooped a mountain full of rice and put it on the plate. <laughs> I thought, oh my God. How in the world are we going to eat this now? <laughs> a mountain full of rice and mountain full of lentil soup and a scoop of vegetable. And the first person to whom she gave the plate was to me. <laughs> so I took the plate and wondering whether to eat or not to eat. And you have no other choice. There are no other eateries anywhere. If you go out of this church, on your right side, there's lots of eateries. Panda is there, Popeyes is there, Samson is there, <laughs> everyone is there. You can go anywhere, but there, there's no one. So you pray, Lord, sanctify, <laughs> sanctify. The very fact that I'm alive today, you know that the food was sanctified that day. So because of scarcity of water they cannot wash their clothes every day so once a year there is a festival in the Tibetan culture called washing festival so they'll go to the rivers and wash all their clothes after washing all the clothes they dry it in the sun when it's dried they take yak butter smear on the clothes Full, just like how you smear yourself with perfumes, you know. They spread, smear the clothes with yak butter and they dry it in the sun. It's yucky. <laughs> that if somehow they believe the yak butter seemed to have some kind of protection layer over their clothes wow. and they wear it, then after drying, they wear the clothes for another one year. Wow. So let's come back to Israel now. So now Israel is walking in the wilderness they have no water right they have been constantly grumbling for lack of water so now there was some water so the Lord told them wash your clothes wash your clothes but you are washing your clothes every day how does this apply to us then the word wash in the Hebrew is kabak k-a-b-a-c which means to trample wash by the stomping of the feet in the olden days that's how they wash their clothes after smearing some uh, soap they put the clothes down and they stamp on their feet have you seen that yes. that's the word kabak stamping trampling down stomping by the feet so what does that mean thoroughly examine oneself thoroughly examine like stomping of the feet you thoroughly examine yourself and ask God to examine your heart ask God to examine your mind Psalms 26 verse 2 Lamentation chapter 3 verse 40 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 28 and Galatians chapter 6 verse 4 Ask God to examine you every day, every night, every morning. The last thing before you go to bed, ask God to examine you. The first thing you get up in the morning, examine you. Asking God to show you His ways. Why you need to do that? The Bible tells us, when you got saved, you are given a garment of salvation and a rope of righteousness. You are putting that on to cover your spiritual nakedness. And Jude verse 23 says, 
that garment can be soiled can be spotted by the works of the flesh so spots can appear on your garment dirt can appear on the spiritual garment and that's the garment you need to wash every day and ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 8 says the garment of salvation should always be clean and white always be clean and white so that's why you need to wash your clothes how do you do that galatians chapter 5 verse 26 says apply the word of god which is like water meditating the word of god will cleanse you cleanse you and that is why we read a demonstration of this when the lord jesus washed the disciples feet in john chapter 13 verse 10 washing is a sign of cleansing so wash yourself with the word of god every day every day you sit in the presence of god not just read the word but meditate the word when you meditate the word the word enters inside you it washes you it cleanses you number 3 principle number 3 don't come near your wives near your wives or your husbands which which means in the lingo is a white sexual relationship for the three days a white all this now why the sexual act is a union between two person second corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 and 15 tells us that that is why wrong sexual union between an unmarried person or married person with different partners is wrong because you are entering into a union it's it's a mystery you know if you read ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 to 26 the Lord, the apostle paul explains about this and he says it's a mystery when you engage in a sexual relationship two souls become one you're joined to one is <coughs> you see when a baby is born the baby takes on the dna of the father and the mother am i right when it takes on the dna father and mother the baby will either look like the father or the mother and exhibit characteristics either like the father or the mother am i right everybody yes you know i have two sisters one older and one younger and uh, i'm the second and i have a younger brother my father a dot my older sister firstly because she was the first born and he loved her too much three much four much and i always wondered why to my younger sister he didn't show that much of affection poor thing you know the middle ones always get am i right everybody yes. is it true in your society yes. see we all are under the same bondage <laughs> anyway so i always wondered why my father always have that special affection for my older sister about 25 years later i went to visit one of my aunt who is my father's sister my father has two sisters so he is the first born and when i saw the his first sister i was awestruck she looked exactly like my older sister exactly dito her skin color her face looks exactly like her and i found out she was my father's favorite so each time he looks at his daughter it reminds him of his favorite sister see dna just like physical dna when you engage in sexual relationship the soul becomes intertwined intertwined that is why the scripture says the two shall become one 
not just in the flesh, but the two soul merges together and they become one. That is why husbands and wives, you know, sometimes they say, without talking, they can telepathically communicate. <laughs> Am I right? I don't have such experience. Am I right, everybody? Yes. One look. The husband understands what the wife wants to say. The wife understands what the husband wants to say. Why? Because they are two, are no more two, they are one. So that is the reason why you should not engage in sexual relationship with anyone except your own married spouse. If you flirt around, you know people do that, right? They sleep with so many person. Can you imagine how kind of how many kind of multiple personalities that's inside them? This is very real, you know. Very real. Their soul becomes so corrupted, yes. so defiled, because of adopting so many different spiritual DNAs. Amen. You do not know who you are sleeping with. Oh. That is why a white. That is why the scripture says, "Do not be unequally yoked." Yes. Why sexual sin is the worst sin is because of this. Never, never engage. In premarital sex or any kind of sex, except only with your legally, lawfully, divinely married spouse. Amen. Amen. That's point number one. Point number two. Man was originally created just for God. He was never in the plan of God in the first place, right? Sorry. She came later, but originally, man was all alone, just for God. Now, I want, I want to bring a very important spiritual principle for you to understand. So, likewise, you should be all for God alone. When you are engaged in a sexual relationship, your only focus is on your spouse, and the spouse looks at you. You don't think about anything else. It's just the two of you in the secret of your bedchamber enjoying your sweet communion. So now God is saying, now be separated because I want you for myself for the next three days. Just you and me. You and me. So stay away from that for the purpose of prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 5. The Apostle Paul gives here some practical guidelines to family living. He says here, except for fasting and prayer, a couple should not avoid sexual relationship among themselves. Married couple, legally married. Because in today's culture, I should be careful to use my words correctly. Because if I just simply say couple, it can mean any couple. Right? So legally, divinely ordain a spouse. So that also means put away distractions that enjoin you to another. That which will take you away from all your focus on the living God. Because you are getting distracted. That is like having a sexual relationship. You are joined to another. Now pull yourself away from the distraction and be yoked together only with the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17. He that is joined to the Lord becomes one with the Lord. Now, this avoidance of sexual relationship for time of prayer also will discipline you to avoid, to abstain from unlawful sexual lusts. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. So, in conclusion, 
Let's read one scripture. Please turn your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel chapter 11. And the verse 32. Daniel chapter 11 verse 32, the second part. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Yeah. I'm sure you have not read this scripture many times before. But please look at the two points. The twofold manifestation of the glory of God in this scripture. The people that do know their God, meaning an intimate knowledge of the character of God. So when you have an intimate knowledge of the character of God, you become that character. You become goodness. You become merciful. You become compassion. You become full of tender love. Full of goodness and truth. When you behold the glories of God every day, every day, sit in the presence of God. Just meditate on Him. Secondly, manifestation of the power of God. They shall do great exploits. Amen? Amen. This is the coming glory of God. And this is the word that I bring to you, that I bring to you from the throne of God concerning what God is going to do in the days to come. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? One final conclusion. This is a special word for Shekinah. When I entered into the church this morning, about 13 minutes past 10, so I stood there and I prayed to prepare myself for what I need to do today. As I was praying, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ appear in this spot. He appeared in this spot and he walked towards me and he said this, he came and stood in the center, the very place where the golden bowl was placed on the first day. He stood in the very place and he looked at me and he said these words, I am going to do a new thing in this church. And before that, I am going to cleanse, wash this church, sweep this church, and then I will manifest my glory in their midst. Hallelujah. So, three things. I am going to do a new thing in this church. Secondly, I am going to sweep this church clean. Sweep it clean, which means there is some debris. Some debris, some dirt, some unclean things, some unwanted things. May not be unclean, but unwanted things like dead leaves, rubbish here, rubbish there, fallen branches that needs to be cleansed, swept away. See, when you sweep something, you don't sweep them to keep them, right? You sweep them away. So they will be swept away out of this church. Then the glory will come. Amen? Amen. Let's all arise for a word of prayer. Mic at the. You have a spare mic? Let's all arise, bow ahead. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my 
Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! When we were singing this song, I heard the Lord Jesus say these words. From now onwards, I am going to manifest as the lion of the trap of Judah in this church. Yes. My people shall know me and shall do great exploits. Yes. Let this be a people who shall humble themselves before my presence and lift up their torches high fill with oil always burning let them be alert at all times no more found sleeping for the days and the times have passed when they have slept but be alert for your enemy walks about like a roaring lion whom he may devour whom he may deceive whom he may sidetrack them from their call from their destiny and from their giftings so be wise as serpents and be harmless as doves. Holy Father, I lift up my hands to bless your people now, Lord. I pray every word that was spoken in this church in these last three days they have become like scrolls that you have planted in this church. And now I pray those words will be alive and active, living in the hearts and the minds of your people here and even those who are afar off all over the world watching this telecast. I pray they will become a people who know their God and who shall do great exploits. From this day, I commend them into your holy hands. From the young to the old, from the baby to the oldest person in this church that your spirit will be upon them yes. the spirit of the Lord will rest upon them the spirit of counsel and might will rest upon them the spirit of knowledge and the fear of God will rest upon them and the spirit of wisdom and revelation will rest upon them and they will walk Led by your spirit in all godly fear and preserve them Lord blameless till you come again in glory I know you have a great plan for each and every one of your dear people I see an amazing vision now while I am praying this prayer and I could not concentrate praying that prayer because my eyes are seeing a wondrous thing in this church I see every one of you transform like a lion seated in your chair everyone everyone from the youngest to the oldest who are here physically here in this church transform 
like a lion seated in the chair thank you Lord Jesus, thank you, Jesus. come on lift up your holy hands bless the Lord come on lift up your hands oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy Lift our hands and say, God is so good. God is so good. Hallelujah. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good. 